I wish that I had a keyboard for life. That sounds odd, doesn't it? Let me elaborate. Keyboards have lots of functions. You can type, 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 sometimes enter capitalized letters, and most notably, delete. But honestly, the most underrated key on the keyboard is the escape button. At this point, you're probably thinking, wow, that's a really cheesy way to somehow connect your speech to the TEDx topic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, back to the keyboard. Imagine waking up knowing that no matter what happened or what you thought, you could escape at the click of a button, delete a mistake you made, or maybe even emphasize your triumphs. Wouldn't that be nice? Like, really, really nice. But why do I really want this keyboard? So that in addition to all the self-correcting and all the self-reflecting, I can escape this negative cycle in my mind, my crippling quest for perfection, and appreciate what I've done right. Perfectionism leaves me feeling empty and undeserving. A major cause of perfectionism is atychophobia, or the fear of failure. Psych Central states, if you went to school, then you have almost certainly been trained to fear failure from an early age. And here's why. Getting the right answer the first time is the only thing rewarded in most schools. In fact, getting the wrong answer is punished in a variety of ways, including low grades, scolding, and contempt from teachers and peers. This has students, and later on adults, believing that the only way to be successful is to never fail. But these perfect computer-like people can't slow down, because no matter how hard they try, it seems as if the person next to them is always doing better. A perfect example of this would be at a speech and debate event I had to go to when I had to deliver a speech in front of a large audience. I worked for hours on that speech and had to argue a position I completely disagreed with. As I was walking on stage, I was literally shaking from the amount of fear of public speaking I have. Yet I pushed through. Afterwards, although there were no major mistakes and everything went fairly well, I couldn't help but focus on the tiny slip-ups that had occurred. I focused intensely on minor mispronunciations. For example, during the not funny at all speech I was giving, the audience began murmuring and chuckling. I couldn't for the life of me figure out why until afterwards when a friend was kind enough to explain to me that I addressed my female opponent as sir. Because of this, I watched a video of the debate over and over and over again until I could pinpoint exactly where it went wrong. It turns out that since I was speaking so quickly, the words, sure, came out as sir. And to this day, that memory haunts me. I felt that no matter how hard I tried, and no matter how well I seemed to have done, those petty slip-ups ruined my opportunity to enjoy the experience. Looking back, it's easy to see how these fallacies dominate people's perceptions. I know personally how hard it is to escape this never-ending loop of negativity and anxiety. But sometimes, no matter how well you believe you did or did not do, you must accept the fact that it's over and there's no magical keyboard in real life. I am my own worst enemy, and it will be a constant battle to befriend myself, while also learning that tiny slip-ups are learning experiences that enable human growth. Professor Carol Dweck has found that people with a fixed mindset believe intelligence and talent are hardwired, and they were born with almost all the natural abilities they'll ever have. 
They tend to avoid challenges and are unwilling to exert too much effort for fear that any failure will prove to others that they're not really good enough and there is nothing they can do about it. These people tend to be very outcome focused. Both success and failure cause extreme anxiety for them. Failure in particular tends to induce a state of helplessness or perfectionist paralysis, making it difficult for them to learn from their mistakes. Eventually, they give up. This sort of mindset began quite a while back for me at a robotics tournament in middle school, where my teammates and I were competing to join the national robotics tournament. As soon as I arrived, I immediately looked at the opposition. High school kids that could completely crush us. Our robot was a tiny, simple clawbot that could score one point at a time compared to mega, mechanical, multitasking giants. It was David against Goliath every match. <laughs> we were the team of new kids with little to no experience in robotics, randomly thrown together because all the other teams had been formed. Yet, throughout the year, our coach pushed the expectations of nationally ranked teams onto our own. I had to win, or else I felt I would have thrown away not only my coach's respect, but my own self-respect. Finally, the buzzer rang, and our robot launched forward, seeking to score one last point, which would advance us to nationals. And with our fingers crossed, it failed. We were failures, or so I believed. That's kind of dark, considering I was 11. I had set myself up, convincing myself that winning was the only option. And so while my teammates were celebrating how far we'd come, I couldn't help but focus on the things I believed I could have fixed, which I believed cost us the match. But it wasn't like this was anything new. Since the beginning, my teammates, one of them more so than others, had been having a fantastic time while I had only focused on winning. This was the first time that I had a significant level of failure, and I couldn't handle it, so I quit. I didn't join robotics again until freshman year. It took me four years to understand that although I didn't succeed, I still could have had a great time just like my teammates, if I didn't focus on the things that didn't matter in the long run. Oh, and when I say four years, I mean it took me until I was actually writing this speech to figure out that it wasn't as traumatizing of an experience as I pictured it to be. Yeah. <laughs> Robotics was extremely important to me, and I quit. Was this going to be a pattern? Could I let perfectionism control me? When I was two years old, barely old enough to remember uh, anything happening around me, my father died from brain cancer. Since then, I have been told amazing stories about him and what he's done for the world from his friends, colleagues, and my mother. Because of this, throughout my childhood, my vision of him was absolute perfection. And any time someone would tell me, you're just like him, I'd think how far I was from it. It only made it worse when I discovered that my passions were his. Suddenly, people saw him in me, but I didn't see him in me. He was perfect. So I strived to be an exact copy of the father I never knew in order to prove I could be successful. When you are young, you forget to do the reality check. He had faults to overcome too, but when I listen to those two-minute stories on him and his inventions, I choose to omit that. Just because the stories took a few minutes to tell, 
doesn't mean it took little to no effort for him to succeed. It took lots of trial and error, and certainly wasn't as easy as everyone puts it out to be. But I chose to forget that. Only recently did I bother asking how long it took to actually make any of his inventions. Robotics was important to me because of my father. I followed it because of him. Success takes time and effort. And perfection, well, I can still try. I've realized that although I might be at the clawbot level now, I have time to work my way up to the pedestal I put my father on. We all want to be perfect, but being able to accept our failures and appreciate what we've done right is instrumental to future success. When we've completed something, we have a choice. We can either focus our energy criticizing what we've done wrong, or accept what we've done right, no matter how minuscule we think it is. Don't think I'm not keeping track right now. <laughs> Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar shows us that we need to take action towards goals we never tried for fear of failure, and accept the fact that it might take more than one attempt to reach that goal. Failure is something that happens, not something you are. This has always been me. And I know there are maybe a little bit more than a few other people out here in the audience tonight who can relate. I am not alone. Around the age of eight, I was given a gift. A gift I use constantly when I'm feeling stressed or anxious or nervous. But before I get there, I need to give you a warning. Take out your cell phones, because this is something you want to write down. Just type that into your cell phone. This mantra, Om Mara Patsanadi, is a mantra of wisdom, a few words in Tibetan. It has the power to guide me when I feel nothing else can. Does it make you laugh? Probably. Well, that's OK. All that matters is it feels good. Thank you. Thank you.